Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. And we'll begin in prayer if you could please stand. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. And make us worthy, O Master, to dare with confidence and without condemnation to call upon Thee, God, as a Heavenly Father, and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, Father Joseph. Our speaker tonight received a Master of Arts degree from Dallas University, a licentiate and doctorate from the John Paul II Institute. In 1977, Dr. Marshner became a founding faculty member at Christendom College and has since served continuously as a professor of theology. He is a well-known author and Protestant convert to the Catholic Church. Please welcome a dear friend, Dr. William Marshner. This series, I'm going to divide up as follows. Tonight, I'm going to lay out the position of the Reformers, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin. What did they have to say about the Mass, which was so new, so different, so revolutionary, and which led not only to different theory in theology, but also to vastly different liturgical practice. Then, God willing, knock on wood, next week I will get to the subject of how the Council of Trent answered these Protestant positions and arguments. And then, if... Uh, uh, time allows, uh, in our third session, I will address the special question of the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist and what the several fights were about there and how we are to understand the Catholic talk of transubstantiation. But for tonight... I am concentrating on the message of the Reformers. And it did not begin where I thought it did. And it had an importance that I would not have expected. Let me read you a sentence that Luther wrote in a little book that he composed to answer King Henry VIII. As you know, in 1520, uh, Henry VIII still thought he was a Catholic and wrote a book in defense of the seven sacraments. And Luther answered this. And in his answer, he has the following sentence, Triumphata Missa, puto nos totam papam triumphare, which is Latin for once the Mass is licked, I think we'll have the Pope licked. Okay? Luther saw the Mass as the cornerstone of the whole edifice of the Catholic Church. So he was keen to attack there. All right. 
Now, remember, Luther had an early period during which he was still a Catholic. So it's interesting to see how he, even in his Catholic period, began to develop deviations, at first quite small, that would, and, and fairly innocent really, that would then turn into huge affairs. In a commentary on the Psalms that he wrote uh, 1513 and following, he insisted that Eucharistic communion should never be separated from the Word of God. Quote, Sacrament and gospel are to receive together. Okay. Therefore, he concludes, it is not licit to confect the Mass without the gospel, privately read in a private Mass, publicly read in a public Mass. Well, that doesn't sound bad. We always had these scripture readings. They're part of the integral rite. Nevertheless, Luther is working his way towards a quite different idea of what the Mass is. Luther knew that throughout antiquity, fathers of the Church, East and West, had called the Mass a sacrificium, sacrificium laudis, a sacrifice of praise. Okay. Well, despite that traditional language, he began to have doubts on this very point. And already in 1520, in a famous sermon on good works. Luther said, it is the worst abuse to conceive the Mass as a sacrifice. Because the Mass, he said, is nothing but a... Um, a bequest. Testament, will, bequest. The Mass is the New Testament in my blood. A testament means a will, he thought. A will from God's Son gives us a bequest. The Mass is a bequest and nothing else. It's not an offering made to God. It's a gift to us, not something we offer to God, said Luther. The only thing that can be thought of as an offering to God are the prayers of thanksgiving and praise, which are said during the celebration of the Mass. Those prayers we offer up, we give to God. So you can call those prayers a sacrifice. But you cannot call the sacrament itself a sacrifice. How do you like that? Interesting. Luther knew that in antiquity it was customary for the lay people to bring uh, natural things, usually gifts of bread and wine, to the church. There the priest would bless them. And he saw a remnant of this ancient custom in the offertory prayers and maintained that that remnant in the offertory is the only element of sacrifice that there is in the Mass. In 
later months of 1520, Luther wrote his larger, more systematic work called the Babylonian Captivity. The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. And in this book, in fact, he mentions several captivities. The third captivity of the church is the captivity of the Holy Sacrament. What? Yes! The captivity consists in conceiving the Holy Sacrament as a good work and as a sacrifice. Uh Uh-huh. If you study the Bible, said Luther already in 1520, what you learn is that the Mass is, above all and only, a bequest. Okay? And this bequest is a promise of forgiveness of sins given to us by God. Okay? And this promise was confirmed by the death of the Son of God. That's the the, the benefit, the, uh, the bequest. And in the Eucharist, the only thing special is that this promise is accompanied by a sensible sign the sacramental procedure involving bread and wine. But this sacramental procedure, this this rite of the Mass, can have no purpose and no effect but to stir up in us the faith that justifies us. That's all it can do. All it could be for. So it is an impious pretense. Do you say impious or do you say impious? <laughs> impious, you like that? Impious. All right, it's an impious pretense. Um, to want to make the Mass a good work applicable to others. So if your parish priest thinks he's doing a good work when he says Mass that pleases God and that this good work is somehow applicable to others, terrible abuse, anti-biblical, monstrous, a captivity of the church. He sees nothing in the Eucharist but the Last Supper somehow remembered, represented, however you want to say that. But what did Christ do at the Last Supper? Luther says, he did not perform a ritual act. He celebrated a supper. He had a supper. Everything that's been added since to that primitive simplicity of the supper is just ceremonial without value. Okay? So said Luther. Now, why can't the Mass be not only a supper, but also a sacrifice? Why can't it be? Here's Luther's answer, in a word. It conflicts with the Mass to be a sacrifice because the Mass is something we receive and a sacrifice is something we give. There it is. Notice, Luther just assumes that there's no real connection between the Mass and Calvary. Somehow or other, Luther got the idea, not from any doctor of the Catholic Church, but I mean, I don't know what semi-pious screeds could have been circulating in 
16th century Germany. But somehow or other he got the idea that in Catholic teaching, the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross only atoned for original sin. Mm -hmm. So all the sins of the living okay, and uh, could only be atoned by masses celebrated in church. So, Calvary for original sin, the mass of sacrifice to take away the sins of living people, and also, if you want to pray for the dead, uh, to alleviate the punishments due, to remit punishments, okay, for those in purgatory. Okay. Now, where Luther got this idea, I do not know. Do you ever hear in the Bible that Christ only died to redeem us from original sin? Nevertheless, that's the position that Luther attributes to us. And so you see what he's doing to completely cut off the Mass from Calvary as though it were a second, not just secondary, but second sacrifice. Christ makes a sacrifice for one thing, we get to make a sacrifice for another thing. And our doing that is a good work. Okay. Now, um, you may recall a couple of, uh, was it a year ago? Was it two years ago? I was in here talking about the Reformation. And I talked about an aspect of Luther's thought that isn't often recalled. Namely, because most Lutherans don't even know it, namely, that there is no such thing as a good human work. Everything we do is marred, stained, corrupted by sin. Remember, Luther said that even the best good work of a righteous man is at least a venial sin? Ah! So the only way in which the Mass itself can be holy is if it's not our doing. Something holy from God we just receive. Everything we do, hence every sacrifice we might make, can only be sinful. Moreover, I mean, you know from the Bible that Christ on his cross abolished all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament, right? So just as the old Israelites maintained that their sacrifices celebrated according to, to the the Aaronic priesthood, completely did away with the legitimacy of any other sacrifice. Hence, sacrifices to Baal, B-A-A-L. Why that's pronounced Baal, I don't know. But sacrifices to Baal were strictly forbidden in Israel. Likewise, once Christ has made his offering on the cross, Luther says, any other sacrifice is strictly forbidden and is, like sacrifices to Baal, hello, idolatrous. Okay. That's where this famous slogan of popish idolatry came from. Okay. I thought that the reason we were accused of practicing idolatry was because of the tradition that developed uh, in the Middle Ages in the West, the tradition of adoring the consecrated host, okay? Carrying our Lord through the streets in a monstrance, so on and so on. Ah, I thought that was where the charge of idolatry came from. It isn't. It came from the idea that the Mass is another sacrifice from that of Christ. 
Hence, something abolished or should have been abolished. Hence, an example of idolatrous pseudo-worship. Is everybody getting this? Oh, yes. Once the theory had been worked out by Luther in the sermons I mentioned and in the Babylonian captivity of the church book, it couldn't be long before liturgical practice began to feel the demand for change. Interestingly enough, Luther didn't introduce the changes. The only reason is because he was locked up in the castle of Wartburg at the time. But while he was locked up, the Dominican monks, oh, not, oh, oh Augustinian monks, oh my gosh, oh, forgive me, say, <laughs> the Augustinian monks in Wittenberg began to take matters into their own hands. There was a preacher named Gabriel Zwilling, who was appointed the preacher for the convent in Wittenberg, and he began to denounce the practice of um, private masses. Okay. And um, withholding from the laity the, uh, the cup. Okay. And um, this guy's willing's sermons were so effective that the prior of the Augustinians in Germany, a certain Father Helt, forbade the celebration of private masses in all conventual churches belonging to his order. Forbade the celebration of private masses. At the same time, he ordered that the chalice be given to the lay people. Now, think a minute, if you don't see it yet, what's the connection between rejecting the idea that the Eucharist is a sacrifice and the campaign to get rid of private masses? What's the connection? Well, in a public mass, you got the congregation there to be preached to and communion to be distributed and a supper sort of a scene enacted. And so Luther thought that was okay. But in a private mass, what can be the point of it? And why were private masses celebrated? Well, people wanted masses said for one or another cause or benefit. Please say mass for the repose of the soul of my mother-in-law. Now there's an act of charity for you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Please say mass for so-and-so who's in danger on the sea, et etc., et cetera. And people would bring little gifts, little stipends to uh, remunerate priests for saying these masses. Well, if the mass is not a sacrifice, okay, it cannot impetrate, it cannot propitiate, it cannot gain any grace or any favors for anybody, so people are wasting their time asking priests to say them and wasting their money paying priests to say them. Luther developed a special term of his own for the diocesan clergy who he thought lived mainly on stipends. He called them mass bellies. Parish priest is a mass belly. Okay. Someone who says mass to fill his belly. 
mass bellies. How do you like that? And in one of his later works, he, Branson, raves that he would sooner give his body over to the flames and be torn apart than permit a mass belly to be compared to our Lord Jesus Christ as offerer or priest of a sacrifice. See what I'm saying? So, the campaign against private masses was taken up very quickly already in 1523 by the um, Augustinian order. Now, I want to say a word about Luther's attitude towards the fact, which he also knew, that a massive tradition was against him. Think of the number of times, at least those of you who, who, who know the first Eucharistic prayer uh, and, uh, and the old, um, the old rite, think of the number of times right in the canon of the Mass that the talk of sacrifice is mentioned. Huh? And, of course, there's a massive body of patristic quotations from the second century right up to Luther's own day calling the Mass a sacrifice. And evidence of canonized saints offering private Mass, so on and so on. Well, what did Luther have to say against this mountain of contrary evidence? He said, I'm not asking how the saints lived or what they said. Scripture should dictate how to live. The issue for us is not one of fact, but one of right, one of law. The saints could err in their teaching, and they could sin in how they lived. But Scripture cannot err in teaching, and one who lives by Scripture will not be sinning. Okay? And here's another quick formula of his. Quid mihi de multitudine et magnitudine errantium. What do I care about the high count and high weight of guys who went wrong? Fortior omnium est veritas. Truth is stronger than all of them. So he wasn't about to admit any contrary of e evidence from church fathers. If they taught other than him, well, they were wrong. And if they celebrated private masses, well, they were sinning. There we go. All right. There is not much more to say about the development of Luther's own thought. He did write a few more small works with eh, angry titles, okay, such as Vom Missbrauch der Messe, on the abuse of the Mass. How about this one? Vom Gruhl der Stillmesse. Translation on the abomination of low mass. <laughs> now, I'm a choir type of guy. I might see something wrong there. <laughs> the abomination of low mass. Why would that be an abomination? Because the priest is only saying it in his own ears. There's no audience there to hear it. It's silent. Even if somebody is there, it's you know practically inaudible. So it can't be a preaching occasion. It can't be a supper-like event. And he won't hear otherwise from any weight of contrary tradition. Now, pretty soon, the pressure started to mount to change the Latin rite, which had been inherited uh, and was still in received usage in Germany, 
I mean, after all, it's one thing to say, well, we're not going to celebrate Mass privately anymore. It's something else to start changing the text. And uh, again, Luther was not the initiator here. Various uh, um, uh, eager people started putting bits and pieces of the Mass into German. Okay. Well, needless to say, different people working in different places produced very different results, and as a result, unity of worship in the Lutheran churches was about to be lost completely. So the pressure was on Luther to produce a new um, Gottesdienst, a new worship service. Which he proceeded to do, and it uh, was written in 1525, finished on Christmas Day, and first came into use January of um, 1526. Did I? And um, I am not going to uh, spend our time together talking about the details of what Luther left out. Okay. When it was his uh, turn to come up with a liturgy uh, for the Mass, obviously he was going to weed out anything that hinted of sacrifice, okay. leaving only uh, what he thought was sound and pure. Well, I want to tell you an ironic story about this. Obviously, he couldn't change the words of institution. This is my body, which has been given up for you. Hmm? For the remission of sins, doesn't it say? Ad remissionem peccatorum. This is my body given for you, for the remission of sins. Couldn't get rid of that. And so here's my little ironic story. My mother, God rest her soul, and it needs a lot of rest, because she remained a very stubborn, very hardcore Lutheran until the end of her days. Okay? And she called me up one time, all in an absolute dither. On a dither. She went to her local Lutheran church and she heard this sermon. And she wasn't sure she was ever going back to that church again. You know what? That preacher had the nerve to get up and say, No, Mom, what? He got up there and he said, that, the, that, that communion was uh, for the unity of the church. What? I never heard such sociological slop in my life. Feel good fellowship, yin yang, it's for the forgiveness of sins. Sure, Mom, you must be right. Well, she was saying about the Eucharist the one thing Luther said nobody should say. Huh? In order to avoid my mother's obvious assumption, what you have to do is say, my body given for you for the remission of sins. Okay? and isolate that from the word this. This surely refers to the visible host. Okay? This is my body. What you see here is my, doesn't look like it, but it is. It is my body. Well, Luther couldn't admit that the Eucharistic body is for the remission of sins. Only our Lord's physical body on Calvary was given up for the remission of sins. 
See? So, you've got to put, for the remission of sins, together with my body, and isolate it from this is it. You see? It's no wonder that um, Luther's ideas proved hard to sustain. All right. Now, I want to talk a minute about... 1530, and the important document called the Augsburg Confession. Well, in English we say Augsburg. It's Augsburg. A-U-G-S-B-U-R-G. Augsburg. What are these Anglo-Saxons going to stop mispronouncing good German words? I'd like to know. The Lutheran churches were called to appear before the emperor and pre present a defense Okay. of what they were doing. The emperor, of course, was uh, Charles V. And he had finally gotten excited about the reformers and what they were up to, uh, very worried about them. So he summoned them to the imperial um, congress called the Diet Parliament, uh, which was held in the town of Worms. And the Lutherans were at Augsburg and wrote up this defense of their position. Now, it was an incredibly savvy document. Hmm? Luther knew that Charles V was not going to tolerate nasty talk about the Mass. So in the entire first half of the Augsburg Confession, they never mentioned it. Okay? The whole first part was devoted to what they call the, the main articles of the faith. Only in the second part does the topic of the Mass come up. And then all they say is that we are falsely accused of abolishing the Mass Nothing could be further from the truth. We've kept it practically unaltered. All the usual observances and so on, we just forbade the corrupt practice of private masses. Hmm? Should be better there. All, there should always be a congregation there. That's the primitive way in the church. We're, 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 we're conservatives here. We're going back to 3rd, 4th, 5th century usage. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And um, so that and okay, 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 we've also um, gotten rid of the prohibition on priests to marry. Okay. What they were doing is making it sound as though their whole quarrel with Rome was over disciplinary matters. Hmm? Whether or not private masses are celebrated in the church is a matter of local canon law and discipline. Whether or not priests are allowed to marry is a matter of canon law and discipline. Right? So they made it sound as though, this, 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 this. we're just trying to clean up some abuses, the disciplinary issues. We're not touching the substance of the Mass. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. So let's put it this way. What the Augsburg Confession says about the Lutheran position on the Mass is misleading. And the Truth doesn't come out until a year or so later when one of Luther's chief sidekicks, a fellow named Schwarzgrund. But Mr. Schwarzgrund didn't like his name. He was a Renaissance humanist kind of guy. So he translated his name into Greek, where it became Melanchthon. Okay, Melanchthon. He had had a big hand in editing the 
the document itself, the Augsburg Confession. Now he was called upon to write a defense of it. Okay. And in that defense, he begins to bring out the whole truth. Listen to this sentence from Melanchthon's defense. Impossibili est consequi remissionem peccatorum propter opus nostrum ex opere operato, said Fide. It's impossible to get forgiveness of sins from a work of ours. Uh, it sort of works of itself. You can only get it from faith. Okay. Hence, the, um, it becomes clearer. Melanchthon denies the sacrificial character of the Mass, but once again, he has a nice way of smoothing over the linguistic problem. Okay. Everybody in church history said it's a sacrifice. You're going to say it's not? But hang on, wait a minute. Melanchthon says, sacrifice is of two kinds. Yes, sacrificium est duplex. Sacrifice is of two kinds. On the one hand, there is the propitiatory sacrifice, and of course that's Calvary. On the other hand, there's the Eucharistic sacrifice. Well, I'm sorry, what is the Eucharistic sacrifice? Oh, that's the offering of praise and thanksgiving that we make to God in saying Mass. Uh -huh. So the Eucharist is a sacrifice only in the sense that our prayers are goodies that we offer up to God. Sacrifice of praise. Okay. So again, the idea that the uh, redemption won by our Lord could be applied to anybody by the Mass is being denied. It cannot participate in any way in being a propitiatory sacrifice. Got to be a sacrifice praise. All right, I have to move on and say something about Zwingli. I've got about four minutes left. Okay, and then something about Calvin. Well, you think you're going to be here a long time? You're not. Because Zwingli and Calvin had practically nothing to add to Luther's attack on the Mass. Zwingli, of course later on disagreed with Luther profoundly over the issue of the real presence. L Zwingli came to maintain that uh, the Eucharist merely symbolizes and in no way contains the reality of our Lord's body and blood. That was the symbolist system. Uh, but on our topic... The only innovation that can be traced directly to Zwingli is the argument from the epistle to the Hebrews. Doesn't it say, where is it, Hebrews 12? Doesn't it say Christ died once for sin? Therefore, his sacrifice is unique. It cannot be repeated it can't be represented. It can't be reoffered. Any notion that our Lord's work on Calvary needs to be, I don't know, like made present again or something like that, said Zwingli, detracts from it. The work of Christ needs no help. It availeth for all forever. No need for any help, applications, whatnot. No need. Okay? Now, 
Subsequently, that line of reasoning becomes a main plank in the Protestant case against the Mass. But it's from Zwingli initially, not from Luther. Calvin tried to walk a middle line between Zwingli and Luther on the question of the real presence. Okay? He couldn't do it. Don't, don't ask me to explain how you can walk a middle line between he is there and he ain't there. <laughs> he sort of is, he sort of ain't. Never, never mind. Um, Calvin wanted a middle line on that position, but as far as the rejection of the Mass as a sacrifice... Calvin takes his line directly from Luther and doesn't add to it anything but more abusive vocabulary. What is this, Latin fans? Horrende abominationus caput foit, cum pestilentissimo errore totum pene orbum obcecavit. The head, the top of the horrible abomination was when Satan, by an error, obscured the whole world. Satan taught us to do what? Fooled the whole world with crateret misam sacrificium et oblationem esse. Ad impetrandum peccatorum remissionum. Satan misled the whole world into thinking that the Mass is a sacrifice, an offering, an oblation to um, impetrate the um, forgiveness of sins. So it's the work of the devil. Okay? And hence... Um, I have to finish. We're out of time, so because I have to finish. But I hope I have given you enough that now you can understand the incredible animus against the Mass in countries where the Reformation prevailed. It wasn't just left unattended, it was abominated. It was denounced as idolatry. It would eventually become a crime to say the Popish Mass, okay, because it pretended to be a sacrifice. Now, what did Trent have to say? How did it answer all of this argumentation? Well, of course I'm not going to tell you. You'll have to come back next week. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you very much, Dr. Marster. We're going to take our usual break for about... Okay, um, so you're saying that Luther says that the Eucharist is the body of Christ, but that Zwingli is not. How can he sustain his own point when he's taking the Eucharist and saying that it's not Jesus' body. Zwingli, you mean? No, Luther. Luther. Well, um, he would say that the host on the altar contains the real body of Christ. He He didn't believe in a change in the substance, but he said the body of Christ is, quote, in, with, and under the appearances of bread and wine. All right? So the body is in this thing, you see. And the body was given up for remission of sins, but this thing you see just contains the body, and it's not offered to overcome anybody's sins. I mean, L- Luther was great at this kind of thing. You, you, you all know the story about... Uh, what he did with Thou Art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. You ever hear this? Oh, 
This is the famous finger pointing exegesis. Okay, here it is. Peter has just said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Luther says, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, you are Peter. Finger turns around, and on this rock, I will build my church. Uh huh. How do you like that? Yes, sir. Well, whatever. Uh, Dr. Marshner, which countries were the most affected or those that most accepted the Reformation? Who had the greatest turmoil nation wise and country wise based on that? All right. Well, the initial brunt is felt in Germany, um, but southern Germany pretty well escapes a lot of it. Northern Germany goes fully over to the Reformation. Um, but there's a huge Reformation party in France called the Huguenots. Uh, England is completely lost. The whole political unit goes over to the Reformation, whereas Germany at least had the advantage of being divided into many little separate states. But England went over as a whole, not counting the Irish, of course, who were plantation workers. But anyway, um, the United Kingdom there. Um, the Reformation also made a tremendous impact in Poland. Everybody forgets that because um, the Counter-Reformation, we want them back. And it made a tremendous incursion in Hungary and in the Czech, what's now the Czech Republic. Okay, so the Reformation was one, and of course Switzerland is gone because of Zwingli. Um, the Hungarians, by the way, were especially vicious. Hungarian Calvinists were especially <laughs> vicious in their attacks on the mass. I just found this out. The Hungarians were the first Calvinists to say that what happens in the Catholic mass is that we worship bread. Yes. In the Catholic Mass, Christ is an illusion and bread is adored. How do you like that? Now, I grew up hearing that in evangelical quarters, so it, that particular piece of nastiness didn't stay in Hungary. But at least those places. Hmm? Uh, Dr. Marshner. Yeah. Um, you didn't speak at all about the English Reformation. So right. what could you speak a little bit about what Brother Henry thought about the Eucharist and Cranmer and all those folks? Okay. Uh, Henry um, maintained the traditional faith in the Eucharist. And thus, we often speak of the Henrichian schism rather than anything else. But the generation that rose uh, after Henry's death to solidify the creation of a Church of England uh, got its ideas mainly from Zwingli, also some from Calvin. But Knox um, and Cranmer and people like that they were mainly inspired by the Zwinglian Calvinist wing. But interestingly enough, the early Anglican documents are pretty quiet on the subject. Uh, even the famous Calvinist um, uh, confession put out in England, the West, Westminster Confession, has only one small article about the Eucharistic issue, the Mass issue. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, the, um, uh, <laughs> that very wily genius, John Henry Newman, <laughs> was able to take practically the whole Catholic system of thought and smuggle it into the 39 articles. <laughs> it just one, didn't want to say much. It's my understanding that uh, during the evolution of Luther's 
thought that he was invited to meet with the Pope once or maybe twice, and they had meetings, and there was some attempt at reconciliation or compromise there. I'm not sure if I have that correct or not. Could you comment on that, please? He was never invited to meet the Pope. However, he was invited to meet with papal emissaries. The most famous of those emissaries was a Dominican cardinal uh, named Thomas de Vio, better known by the name of his titular church in Rome, Cardinal Cajetan, Gaetano, for those of you who speak true language, Gaetano. Anyway, um, he had a famous colloquy with Luther and tried to convince Luther of the errors of his ways. Luther was um, quite unpersuadable, quite deaf. But uh, in the aftermath of that colloquy, uh, Cajetan wrote a small book on the, um, the uh, Calvary and the Mass in which he explains very beautifully the connection. So he became a for, uh, prominent theologian of this issue. Um, other times Lutherans were uh, invited, Luther himself would be invited to what we would call an ecumenical parley, where there would be Protestant debaters and Catholic debaters okay, on the hustings. And um, there were several events of that kind. Uh, Luther would fume and fuss. Melanchthon was a much better debater. Luther would just lose his temper and get vulgar. Melanchthon was a pretty good debater. And I wanted to mention to this before, didn't have occasion to do so, don't think that the only people writing books on the Eucharist in this period were their guys. We had a number of very active authors answering Luther's stuff from the beginning. It's just that their words are, their, work, their, their names are not household names. Have you ever heard of Cochleus? Have you ever heard of Clichtovius? How about Johannes Eck? Ah, because the Lutherans have him in their movie. <laughs> ah. But we had, I don't know, five, six uh, quite active defenders on our side. Um, is there any uh, evidence or reason to think that Luther got his views from anything other than his uh, views of Scripture? I mean, he, Luther's views of this, the sacrifice of the Mass or the absence of the sacrifice of the Mass, mm -hmm. did he get them from Scripture or is that, I mean, or somewhere else? Well, um, I'm, I'm going to have to give you my own hypothetical or theoretical or speculative answer to that. I think that the trouble starts deep in Luther's thinking about sin. Okay. Um, he made the mistake of believing that concupiscence, disordered desire, is not only in us as a result of the fall, but is identically original sin itself, that disordered desire is itself sin. In other words, if you're tempted, you're sinning. Well, what's the point of resisting? Jeez, I'm sinning already. I'm feeling a temptation. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, um, so so uh, concupiscence was already formal sin. And that's where he got the idea that no human work could really be a collaboration with God, could really be good, could really be holy, could really contribute to the increase of grace or anything like that. All right? Um, and hence he developed this totally passive idea of faith as a pure reception of a promise. Once he's got the idea that salvation is the purely passive reception of a promise, salvation in this life. The way to his purely um, judicial approach to justification is opened up. It's got to be God saying, okay, you're innocent, get out of here. And, uh, you know, anything we do in the Mass that looks like a human work just can't be really of God.
Okay. Now, where did he get these awfully grouchy, you want to say hyper-scrupulous notions about the sinful character of disordered desire even if you don't act on it? Maybe his father beat him. <laughs> I don't know. We got to cut it off. Thank you very much, Dr. Marshner. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.